Good evening and welcome back to Booked for the Night. I'm Melissa Phillips and tonight I'm reading chapters 23 through 24 of East of Eden by John Steinbeck. Enjoy. Part 3, Chapter 23 The Hamiltons were strange, high-strung people, and some of them were tuned too high and they snapped. This happens often in the world. Of all his daughters, Una was Samuel's greatest joy. Even as a little girl, she hungered for learning as a child does for cookies in the late afternoon. Una and her father had a conspiracy about learning. Secret books were borrowed and read and their secrets communicated privately. Of all the children, Una had the least humor. She met and married an intense dark man, a man whose fingers were stained with chemicals, mostly silver nitrate. He was one of those men who live in poverty so that their lines of questioning may continue. His question was about photography. He believed that the exterior world could be transferred to paper, not in the ghost shadings of black and white, but in the colors the human eye perceives. His name was Anderson and he had little gift for communication. Like most technicians, he had a terror and a contempt for speculation. The inductive leap was not for him. He dug a step and pulled himself up one single step, the way a man climbs the last shoulder of a mountain. He had great contempt, born of fear for the Hamiltons, for they all half believed they had wings, and they had got some bad falls that way. Anderson never fell, never slipped back, never flew. His steps moved slowly, slowly upward, and in the end, it is said, he found what he wanted, color film. He married Una, perhaps, because she had little humor, and this reassured him. And because her family frightened and embarrassed him, he took her away to the north, and it was black and lost where he went, somewhere on the borders of Oregon. He must have lived a very primitive life with his bottles and papers. Una wrote bleak letters without joy, but also without self-pity. She was well, and she hoped her family was well. Her husband was near to his discovery. And then she died, and her body was shipped home. I never knew Una. She was dead before I remember, but George Hamilton told me about it many years later, and his eyes filled with tears and his voice croaked in the telling. Una was not a beautiful girl like Molly, he said, but she had the loveliest hands and feet. Her ankles were as slender as grass, and she moved like grass. Her fingers were long and the nails narrow and shaped like almonds. And Una had lovely skin, too, translucent, even glowing. She didn't laugh and play like the rest of us. There was something set apart about her. She seemed always to be listening. When she was reading, her face would be like the face of one listening to music. And when we asked her any question, why, she gave the answer, if she knew it. Not pointed up and full of color and maybes and it might bees, the way the rest of, the, of us would. We were always full of bull. There was some pure simple thing in Una, George said. And then they brought her home. Her nails were broken to the quick and her fingers cracked and all worn out. And her poor dear feet. George could not go on for a while. And then he said with fierceness of a man trying to control himself. Her feet were broken and gravel cut and briar cut. Her dear feet had not worn shoes for a long time. And her skin was rough as rawhide. We think it was an accident, he said. So many chemicals around. We think it was. But Samuel thought and mourned in the thought that the accident was pain and despair. Una's death struck Samuel like a silent earthquake. He said no brave and reassuring words. He simply sat alone and rocked himself. He felt that it was his neglect had done it. And now his tissue, which had fought joyously against time, gave up a little. His young skin turned old. His clear eyes dulled, and a little stoop came to his great shoulders. Liza, with her acceptance, could take care of tragedy. She had no real hope this side of heaven. But Samuel had put up a laughing wall against natural laws, and Una's death breached his battle. He became an old man. His other children were doing well. George was in the insurance business. Will was getting rich. Joe had gone east and was helping to invent a new profession called advertising. Joe's very faults were virtues in this field. He found that he could communicate his material daydreaming 
and properly applied, that is all advertising is. Joe was a big man in a new field. The girls were married, all except Desi, and she had a successful dressmaking business in Salinas. Only Tom had never got started. Samuel told Adam Trask that Tom was arguing with greatness, and the father watched his son and could feel the drive and the fear, the advance and the retreat, because he could feel it in himself. Tom did not have his father's lyric softness or his gay good looks, but you could feel Tom when you came near to him. You could feel strength and warmth and an iron integrity. And under all of this was a shrinking, a shy shrinking. He could be as gay as his father, and suddenly in the middle of it, it would be cut the way you would cut a violin string, and you could watch Tom go whirling into darkness. He was a dark-faced man. His skin, perhaps from sun, was a black red, as though some Norse or perhaps vandal blood was perpetuated in him. His hair and beard and mustache were dark red, too, and his eyes gleamed startlingly blue against the coloring. He was powerful, heavy of shoulders and arm, but his hips were slim. He could lift and run and hike and ride with anyone, but he had no sense of competition, whatever. Will and George were gamblers and often tried to entice, entice their brother into the joys and sorrows of venture. Tom said, I've tried it, and it just seems tiresome. I've thought, why this must be. I get no great triumph when I win and no tragedy when I lose. Without these, it is meaningless. It is not a way to make money, that we know, and unless it can st simulate birth and death, joy and sorrow, it seems, at least to me, it feels, it doesn't feel at all. I would do it if I felt anything, good or bad. Will did not understand this. His whole life was competitive, and he lived by one kind of gambling or another. He loved Tom, and he tried to give him the things he himself found pleasant. He took him into business and tried to inoculate him with the joys of buying and selling, of outwitting other men, of judging them for a bluff, or living by maneuver. Always, Tom came back to the ranch, puzzled, not critical, but feeling that somewhere he had lost track. He felt that he should take joy in the man pleasures of contest, but he could not pretend to himself that he did. Samuel had said that Tom always took too much on his plate, whether it was beans or women. And Samuel was wise, but I think he knew only one side of Tom. Maybe Tom opened up a little more for children. What I set down about him will be the result of memory, plus what I know to be true, plus conjecture built on the combination. Who knows whether it will be correct? We lived in Salinas, and we knew when Tom had arrived. I think he always arrived at night, because under our pillows, Mary's and mine, there would be packages of gum. And gum was valuable in those days, just as a nickel was valuable. There were months when he did not come, but every morning, as soon as we awakened, we put our hands under our pillows to see. And I still do it, and it has been many years since there has been gum there. My sister Mary did not want to be a girl. It was misfortune she could not get used to. She was an athlete, a marble player, a pitcher of one a cat, and the trappings of a girl inhibited her. Of course, this was long before the compensations for being a girl were apparent to her. Just as we knew that somewhere on our bodies, probably under the arm, there was a button which if pressed just right would permit us to fly, so Mary had worked out a magic for herself to change her over into the tough little boy she wanted to be. If she went to sleep in a magical position, knees crooked just right, head at a magical angle, fingers all crossed one over the other, in the morning she would be a boy. Every night she tried to find exactly the right combination, but she never could. I used to help her cross her fingers like shiplap. She was despairing of ever getting it right when one morning there was gum under the pillow. We each peeled a stick and solemnly chewed it. It was Beeman's peppermint and nothing so delicious had been made since. Mary was pulling on her long black rib stockings when she said with great relief, Of course! Of course what? I asked. Uncle Tom, she said, and chewed her gum with great snapping sounds. Uncle Tom what? I demanded. He'll know how to get to be a boy. There it was, just as simple as that. I wondered why I hadn't thought of it myself. Mother was in the kitchen overseeing a new little Danish girl who worked for us. 
We had a series of girls. Newcome Danish farm families put their daughters out to service with American families, and they learned not only English, but American cooking and table setting and manners and all the little niceties of high life in Salinas. At the end of a couple of years of this, at $12 a month, the girls were highly desirable wives for American boys. Not only did they have American manners, but they could still work like horses in the fields. Some of the most elegant families in Salinas today are descended from these girls. It would be a flaxen-haired Matilda in the kitchen, with mother clucking over her like a hen. We charged in. Is he up? Shh, said mother. He got in late. You let him sleep. But the water was running in the basin of the back bedroom, so we knew he was up. We crouched like cats at his door, waiting for him to emerge. There was always a little difference between us at first. I think Uncle Tom was as shy as we were. I think he wanted to come running out and toss us in the air, but instead we were all formal. Thank you for the gum, Uncle Tom. I'm glad you like it. Do you think we'll have an oyster loaf late at night while you're here? We'll certainly try if your mother will let you. We drifted into the sitting room and sat down. Mother's voice called from the kitchen. Children, you let him alone. They're all right, Ollie, he called back. We sat in a triangle in the living room. Tom's face was so dark and his eyes so blue. He wore good clothes, but he never seemed well dressed. In this, he was very different from his father. His red mustache was never neat, and his hair would not lie down, and his hands were hard from work. Mary said, Uncle Tom, how do you get to be a boy? How? Why, Mary, you're just born a boy. No, that's not what I mean. How do I get to be a boy? Tom studied her gravely. You? he asked. Her words poured out. I don't want to be a girl, Uncle Tom. I want to be a boy. A girl's all kissing and dolls. I don't want to be a girl. I don't want to. Tears of anger welled up in Mary's eyes. Tom looked down at his hands and picked at a loose piece of callus with a broken nail. He wanted to say something beautiful, I think. He wished for words like his father's words, sweet-winged words, cooing and lovely. I wouldn't like you to be a boy, he said. Why not? I like you as a girl. An idol was crashing in Mary's temple. You mean you like girls? Yes, Mary, I like girls very much. A look of distaste crossed Mary's face. If it were true, Tom was a fool. She put on her don't give me any of that crap tone. All right, she said, but how do I go about being a boy? Tom had a good ear. He knew he was reeling down in Mary's estimation and he wanted her to love him and to admire him. At the same time, there was a fine steel wire of truthfulness in him that cut off the heads of fast-traveling lies. He looked at Mary's hair, so light that it was almost white, and braided tight to be out of the way, and dirty at the end of the braid, for Mary wiped her hands on her braid before she made a difficult mar marble shot. Tom studied her cold and hostile eyes. I don't think you really want to change. I do. Tom was wrong. She really did. Well, he said, you can't, and someday you'll be glad. I won't be glad, said Mary, and she turned to me and said with frigid contempt, he doesn't know. Tom winced and I shivered at the immensity of her criminal charge. Mary was braver and more ruthless than most. That's why she won every marble in Salinas. Tom said uneasily, if your mother says it's all right, I'll order the oyster loaf this morning and pick it up tonight. I don't like oyster loaves, said Mary, and stalked to our bedroom and slammed the door. Tom looked ruefully after her. She's a girl, all right, he said. Now we were alone together, and I felt that I had to heal the wound Mary had made. I love oyster loaves, I said. Sure you do. So does Mary. Uncle Tom... Don't you think there's some way for her to be a boy? No, I don't, he said sadly. I would have told her had I known. She's the best pitcher in the West End. 
Tom sighed and looked down at his hands again, and I could see his failure on him, and I was sorry for him, aching sorry. I brought out my hollowed cork with pins stuck down to make bars. Would you like to have my fly cage, Uncle Tom? Oh, he was a great gentleman. Do you want me to have it? Yes. You see, you put up a pin to get the fly in, and then he sits in there and buzzes. I'd like to have it very much. Thank you, John. He worked all day with a sharp, tiny pocket knife on a small block of wood, and when we came home from school, he had carved a little face. The eyes and ears and lips were movable, and little perches connected them with the inside of the hollow head. At the bottom of the neck, there was a hole closed by a cork, and this was very wonderful. You caught a fly and eased him through the hole and set the cork, and suddenly the head became alive. The eyes moved and the lips talked and the ears wiggled as the frantic fly crawled over the little perches. Even Mary forgave him a little, but she never really trusted him until after she was glad she was a girl, and then it was too late. He gave the head not to me, but to us. We still have it put away somewhere, and it still works. Sometimes Tom took me fishing. We started before the sun came up and drove in the rig straight toward Fremont's Peak. As we neared the mountains, the stars would peel out and the light would rise to blacken the mountains. I can remember riding and pressing my ear and cheek against Tom's coat, and I can remember that his arm would rest lightly over my shoulders and his hand pat my arm occasionally. Finally, we would pull up under an oak tree and take the horse out of the shafts, water him at the stream side, and halter him to the back of the rig. I don't remember that Tom talked. Now that I think of it, I can't remember the sound of his voice or the kind of words he used. I can remember both about my grandfather, but when I think of Tom, it is a memory of a kind of warm silence. Maybe he didn't talk at all. Tom had beautiful tackle and made his own flies, but he didn't seem to care whether we caught trout or not. He needed not triumph over animals. I remember the five-fingered ferns growing under little waterfalls, bobbing their green fingers as the droplets struck them. And I remember the smell of the hills, wild azalea and a very distant skunk, and the sweet cloy of lupin and horse sweat on harness. I remember the sweeping, lovely dance of high buzzards against the sky, and Tom looking long up at them, but I can't remember that he ever said anything about them. I remember holding the bite of a line while Tom drove pegs and braided a splice. I remember the smell of crushed ferns in the creel and the delicate sweet odor of fresh damp rainbow trout lying so prettily on the green bed. And finally, I can remember coming back to the rig and pouring rolled barley into the leather feed bag and bucking it over the horse's head behind the ears. And I have no sound of his voice or words in my ear. He is dark and silent and hugely warm in my memory. Tom felt his darkness. His father was beautiful and clever. His mother was short and mathematically sure. Each of his brothers and sisters had looks or gifts or fortune. Tom loved all of them passionately, but he felt heavy and earthbound. He climbed ecstatic mountains and floundered in the rocky darkness between the peaks. He had spurts of bravery, but they were bracketed in battens of cowardice. Samuel said that Tom was quavering over greatness, trying to decide whether he could take the cold responsibility. Samuel knew his son's quality and he felt the potential of violence, and it frightened him, for Samuel had no violence. Even when he hit Adam Trask with his fist, he had no violence. And the books that came into the house, some of them secretly, well, Samuel rode lightly on top of a book as he balanced happily among ideas, the way a man rides white rapids in a canoe. But Tom got into a book, crawled and groveled between the covers, tunneled like a mole among the thoughts, and came up with the book all over his face and hands. Violence and shyness, Tom's loins needed women, and at the same time he did not think himself worthy of a woman. For long periods, he would welter in a howling celibacy, and then he would take a train to San Francisco and roll and wallow in women, and then he would come back silently to the ranch, feeling weak and unfulfilled and unworthy, and he would punish himself with work, would plow and plant unprofitable land, would cut tough oak wood until his back was breaking and his arms were weary rags. 
It is probable that his father stood between Tom and the sun, and Samuel's shadow fell on him. Tom wrote secret poetry, and in those days it was only sensible to keep it secret. The poets were pale emasculates, and Western men held them in contempt. Poetry was a symptom of weakness, of degeneracy, and decay. To read it was to court catcalls. To write it was to be suspected and ostracized. Poetry was a secret vice, and properly so. No one knows whether Tom's poetry was any good or not, for he showed it to only one person, and before he died he burned every word. From the ashes in the stove there must have been a great deal of it. Of all his family, Tom loved Desi best. She was gay, laughter filled on her doorstep. Her shop was a unique institution in Salinas. It was a woman's world. Here, all the rules and the fears that created the iron rules went down. The door was closed to men. It was a sanctuary where women could be themselves. Smelly, wanton, mystic, conceited, truthful, and interested. The whalebone corsets came off at Dessie's, the sacred corsets that molded and warped women flesh into goddess flesh. At Dessie's, they were women who went to the toilet and overate and scratched and farted, and from this freedom came laughter, roars of laughter. Men could hear the laughter through the closed door and were properly frightened at what was going on, feeling perhaps that they were the butt of the laughter, which to a large extent was true. I can see Dessie now her gold pinnae's wobbling on a nose not properly bridged, her eyes streaming with hilarious tears and her whole front constricted with muscular spasms of laughter. Her hair would come down and drift between her glasses and her eyes, and the glasses would fall off her wet nose and spin and swing at the end of their black ribbon. You had to order a dress from Desi months in advance, and you made 20 visits to her shop before you chose material and pattern. Nothing so healthy as Desi had ever happened to Salinas. The men had their lodges, their clubs, their whorehouses, the women nothing but the altar guild and the mincing coquetry of the minister until Desi came along. And then Desi fell in love. I do not know any details of her love affair, who the man was or what the circumstances, whether it was religion or a living wife, a disease or a selfishness. I guess my mother knew, but it was one of those things put away in a family closet and never brought out. And if other people in Salinas knew, they must have kept it a loyal town secret. All I do know is that it was a hopeless thing, gray and terrible. After a year of it, the joy was all drained out of Desi, and the laughter had ceased. Tom raged crazily through the hills like a lion in horrible pain. In the middle of a night, he saddled and rode away, not waiting for the morning train to Salinas. Samuel followed him and sent a telegram from King City to Salinas. And when in the morning, Tom, his face black, spurred his spent horse up John Street in Salinas, the sheriff was waiting for him. He disarmed Tom and put him in a cell and fed him black coffee and brandy until Samuel came for him. Samuel did not lecture Tom. He took him home and never mentioned the incident, and the stillness fell on the Hamilton place. On Thanksgiving of 1911, the family gathered at the ranch. All the children except Joe, who was in New York, and Lizzie, who had left the family and joined another, and Una, who was dead. They arrived with presents and more food than even this clan could eat. They were all married save Desi and Tom. Their children filled the Hamilton place with riot. The home place flared up, noisier than it had ever been. The children cried and screamed and fought. The men made many trips to the forge and came back self-consciously wiping their mustaches. Liza's little round face grew redder and redder. She organized and ordered. The kitchen stove never went out. The beds were full and comforters laid on pillows on the floor were for children. Samuel dug up his old gaiety. His sardonic mind glowed and his speech took on its old singing rhythm. He hung on with the talk of the singing and the memories, and then suddenly, and at not midnight, he tired. Weariness came down on him, and he went to his bed where Liza had been for two hours. He was puzzled at himself, not that he had to go to bed, but that he wanted to. When the mother and father were gone, Will brought the whiskey in from the forge, and the clan had a meeting in the kitchen with whiskey passed around and round-bottom jelly glasses. 
The mothers crept to the bedrooms to see that the children were covered and then came back. They all spoke softly, not to disturb the children and the old people. There were Tom and Dessie, George and his pretty Mamie, who had been a Dempsey, Molly and William J. Martin, Olive and Ernest Steinbeck, Will and his Delia. They all wanted to say, say the same thing, all ten of them. Samuel was an old man. It was as startling a discovery as the sudden scene of a ghost. Somehow, they had not believed it could happen. They drank their whiskey and talked softly of the new thought. His shoulders, did you see how they slump? And there's no spring in his step. His toes drag a little, but it's not that. It's in his eyes. His eyes are old. He never would go to bed until last. Did you notice he forgot what he was saying right in the middle of a story? It's his skin told me. It's gone wrinkled and the backs of his hands have turned transparent. He favors his right leg. Yes, but that's the one the horse broke. I know, but he never favored it before. They said these things in outrage. This can't happen, they were saying. Father can't be an old man. Samuel is young as the dawn, the perpetual dawn. He might get old as midday, maybe, but sweet God, the evening cannot come, and the night, sweet God, no. It was natural that their minds leaped on and recoiled, and that they would not speak of that, but their minds said, there can't be any world without Samuel. How could we think about anything without knowing what he thought about it? What would the spring be like, or Christmas, or rain? There couldn't be a Christmas. Their minds shrank away from such thinking, and they looked for a victim, someone to hurt, because they were hurt. They turned on Tom. You were here. You've been here all along. How did this happen? When did it happen? Who did this to him? Have you by any chance done this with your craziness? And Tom could stand it, because he had been with it. It was Una, he said hoarsely. He couldn't get over Una. He told me how a man, a real man, had no right to let sorrow destroy him. He told me again and again how I must believe that time would take care of it. He said it so often that I knew he was losing. Why didn't you tell us? Maybe we could have done something. Tom leaped up, violent and cringing. God damn it! What was there to tell? That he was dying of sorrow? That the morrow had melted out of his bones? What was there to tell? You weren't here. I had to look at it and see his eyes died down. God damn it. Tom went out of the room and they heard his clodhopper feet knocking on the flinty ground outside. They were ashamed. Will Martin said, I'll go out and bring him back. Don't do it, George said quickly, and the blood kid nodded. Don't do it. Let him alone. We know him from the insides of ourselves. In a little while, Tom came back. I want to apologize, he said. I'm very sorry. Maybe I'm a little drunk. Father calls it jolly when I do it. One night I rode home. It was a confession. And I came staggering across the yard and I fell into the rose bush and crawled up the stairs on my hands and knees and I was sick on the floor beside my bed. In the morning I tried to tell him I was sorry. And do you know what he said? Why, Tom, you were just jolly. Jolly. If I did it, a drunken man didn't crawl home, just jolly. George stopped the crazy flow of talk. We want to apologize to you, Tom, he said. Why, we sounded as though we were blaming you and we didn't mean to. Or maybe we did mean to, and we're sorry. Will Martin said realistically, It's too hard a life here. Why don't we get him to sell out and move to town? He could have a long and happy life. Molly and I would like them to come and live with us. I don't think he'll do it, said Will. He's stubborn as a mule and proud as a horse. He's got a pride like brass. Olive's husband, Ernest, said, Well, there'd be harm, no harm in asking him. We would like to have him, or both of them, with us. Then they were silent again, for the idea of not having the ranch, the dry, stony desert of heartbreaking hillside and unprofitable hollow, was shocking to them. Will Hamilton, from instinct and training in business, had become a fine reader of the less profound impulses of men and women. He said, If we ask him to close up shop, it will be like asking him to close his life, and he won't do it. You're right, Will, George agreed. He would think it was like quitting. He'd feel it was a cowardice. No, he will never sell out, and if he did, I don't think he'd live a week. 
Will said. There's another way. Maybe he could come for a visit. Tom can run the ranch. It's time father and mother saw something of the world. All kinds of things are happening. It would freshen him, and then he could come back and go to work again. And after a while, maybe he wouldn't have to. He says himself that thing about time doing the job dynamite, dynamite can't touch. Dessie brushed the hair out of her eyes. I wonder if you really think he's that stupid, she said. And Will said out of his experience, Sometimes the man wants to be stupid if it lets him do a thing his cleverness forbids. We can try it anyway. What do you all think? There was a nodding of heads in the kitchen, and only Tom sat rocking and brood, rock like and brooding. Tom, wouldn't you be willing to take over the ranch? George asked. Oh, that's nothing, said Tom. It's no trouble to run the ranch because the ranch doesn't run, never has. Then why don't you agree? I'd find a reluctance to insult my father, Tom said. He'd know. But where's the harm in suggesting it? Tom rubbed his ears until he forced the blood out of them, and for a moment they were white. I don't forbid you, he said, but I can't do it. George said, we could write it in a letter, a kind of invitation, full of jokes, and when he got tired of one of us, why, he could go to another. There's years of visiting among the lot of us. And that was how they left it. Tom brought Olive's letter from King City, and because he knew what it contained, he waited until he saw Samuel alone before he gave it to him. Samuel was working in the forge and his hands were black. He took the envelope by a tiny corner and put it on the anvil, and then he scrubbed his hands in the half barrel of black water into which he plunged hot iron. He slit the letter open with the point of a horseshoe nail and went into the sunlight to read it. Tom had the wheels off the buckboard and was buttering the axles with yellow axle grease. He watched his father from the corners of his eyes. Samuel finished the letter and folded it and put it back in its envelope. He sat down on the bench in front of the shop and stared into space. Then he opened the letter and read it again and folded it again and put it in his blue shirt pocket. Then Tom saw him stand up and walk slowly up the eastern hill, kicking at the flints on the ground. There had been a little rain and a fuzz of miserly, miserly grass had started up. Halfway up the hill, Samuel squatted down and took up a handful of the harsh, gravelly earth in his palm and spread it with his forefinger, flint and stand, sandstone and bits of shining mica and a frail rootlet and a vein stone. He let it slip from his hand and brushed his palms. He picked a spear of grass and set it between his teeth and stared up at the hill to the sky. A gray nervous cloud was scurrying eastward, searching for trees on which to rain. Samuel stood up and sauntered down the hill. He looked into the tool shed and patted the four-by-four four supports. He paused near Tom and spun one of the free-running wheels of the buckboard, and he inspected Tom as though he had saw him for the first time. Why, you're a grown-up man, he said. Didn't you know? I guess I did. I guess I did said Samuel and sauntered on. There was the sardonic look on his face his family knew so well, the joke on himself that made him laugh inwardly. He walked by the sad little garden and all around the house, not a new house anymore. Even the last added lean-to bedrooms were old and weathered and the putty around the window panes had shrunk away from the glass. At the porch, he turned and surveyed the whole home cup of the ranch before he went inside. Liza was rolling out pie crust on the flowery board. She was so expert with the rolling pin that the dough seemed alive. It flattened out and then pulled back a little from tension in itself. Liza lifted the pale sheet of it and laid it over one of the pie tins and trimmed the edges with a knife. The prepared berries lay deep in red juice in a bowl. Samuel sat down in the kitchen chair and crossed his legs and looked at her. His eyes were smiling. Can't you find something to do this time of day? She asked. Oh, I guess I could, Mother, if I wanted to. Well, don't sit there and make me nervous. The paper's in the other room if you're feeling day lazy. I've read it, said Samuel. All of it? All I want to. Samuel, what's the matter with you? You're up to something. I can see it in your face. Now tell it and let me get on with my pies. He swung his leg and smiled at her. Such a little bit of a wife, he said. 
Three of her is hardly a bite. Samuel, now you stop this. I don't mind a joke in the evening sometimes, but it's not 11 o'clock. Now you go along. Samuel said, Liza, do you know the meaning of the English word vacation? Now, don't you make jokes in the morning. Do you, Liza? Of course I do. Don't play me for a fool. What does it mean? Going away for a rest to the sea and the beach. Now, Samuel, get out with your fooling. I wonder how you know the word. Will you tell me what you're after? Why shouldn't I know? Did you ever have one, Liza? Why, I... She stopped. In 50 years, did you ever have a vacation, you little silly half-pint smidgen of a wife? Samuel, please go out of my kitchen, she said apprehensively. He took the letter from his pocket and unfolded it. It's from Ollie, he said. She wants us to come and visit in Salinas. They fixed over the upstairs rooms. She wants us to get to know the children. She's got us tickets for the Chattaqua season. Billy Sunday is going to wrestle with the devil and Brian is going to make his cross of gold speech. I'd like to hear that. It's an old fool of a speech, but they say he gives it in a way to break your heart. Liza rubbed her nose and flowered it with her finger. Is it very costly? She asked anxiously. Costly? Ollie has bought the tickets. They're a present. We can't go, said Liza. Who'd run the ranch? Tom would. What running there is to do in the winter? He'd be lonely. George would maybe come out and stay a while to go quail hunting. See what's in the letter, Liza. What are those? Two tickets to Salinas on the train. Ollie says she doesn't want to give us a single escape. You can just turn them in and send her money. The, send her back the money. No, I can't. Why, Liza, mother, now don't. Here, here's a handkerchief. That's a dish towel, said Liza. Sit here, mother. There. I guess the shock of taking a rest kind of threw you. Here, I know it's a dish towel. They say that Billy Sunday drives the devil all over the stage. That's a blasphemy, said Liza. But I'd like to see it. Wouldn't you? What do you say? Hold up your head. I didn't hear you. What, what did you say? I said yes, said Liza. Tom was making a drawing when Samuel came into him. Tom looked at his fa father with veiled eyes, trying to read the effect of Olive's letter. Samuel looked at the drawing. What is it? I'm trying to work out a gate opener so a man won't have to get out of his rig. Here's the pull rod to open the latch. What's it going to open? I figured a strong spring. Samuel studied the drawing. Then what's going to close it? This bar here. It would slip to this spring with a tension the other way. I see, said Samuel. It might work, too, if the gate was truly hung, and it would only take twice as much time to make and keep up as 20 years of getting out of the rig and opening the gate. Tom protested. Sometimes with a skittish horse. I know, said his father. But the main reason is that it's fun. Tom grinned. Caught me, he said. Tom, do you think you could look after the ranch if your mother and I took a little trip? Why, sure, said Tom. Where do you plan to go? Ollie wants us to stay with her for a while in Salinas. Why, that would be fine, said Tom. Is mother agreeable? She is. Always forgetting the expense. That's fine, said Tom. How long do you plan to be gone? Samuel's jeweled, sardonic eyes dwelt on Tom's face until Tom said, What's the matter, father? It's the little tone, son. So little that I could barely hear it, but it was there. Tom, my son, if you have a secret with your brothers and sisters, I don't mind. I think that's good. I don't know what you mean, said Tom. You may thank God you didn't want to be an actor, Tom, because you would have been a very bad one. You worked it out at Thanksgiving, I guess, when you were all together, and it's working smooth as butter. I see Will's hand in this. Don't tell me if you don't want to. I wasn't in favor of it, said Tom. It doesn't sound like you, his father said. You'd be for scattering the truth out in the sun for me to see. Don't tell the others, I know. 
He turned away and then came back and put his hand on Tom's shoulders. Thank you for wanting to honor me with the truth, my son. It's not clever, but it's more permanent. I'm glad you're going. Samuel stood in the doorway of the forge and looked at the land. They say a mother loves best an ugly child, he said, and he shook his head sharply. Tom, I'll trade you honor for honor. Will you will please hold this in your dark secret place, nor tell any of your brothers and sisters. I know why I'm going, and Tom, I know where I'm going, and I am content. Chapter 24 I have wondered why it is that some people are less affected and torn by the verities of life and death than others. Una's death cut the earth from under Samuel's feet and opened his def and open his defended keep and let in old age. On the other hand, Liza, who surely loved her family as deeply as did her husband, was not destroyed or warped. Her life continued evenly. She felt sorrow, but she survived it. I think perhaps Liza accepted the world as she accepted the Bible, with all of its paradoxes and its reverses. She did not like death, but she knew it existed, and when it came, it did not surprise her. Samuel may have thought and played and philosophized about death, but he did not really believe in it. His world did not have death as a member. He and all around him was immortal. When real death came, it was an outrage, a denial of the immortality he deeply felt, and the one crack in his wall caused the whole structure to crash. I think he had always thought he would argue himself out of death. It was a personal opponent, and one he could lick. To Liza, it was simply death, the thing promised and expected. She, should go, she could go on and in her sorrow put a pot of beans in the oven, bake six pies, and plan to exactness how much food would be necessary properly to feed the funeral guests. And she could in her sorrow see that Samuel had a clean white shirt and that his black broadcloth was brushed and free of spots and his shoes blacked. Perhaps it takes these two kinds, of, two kinds to make a good marriage riveted with several kinds of strengths. Once Samuel accepted, he could probably go farther than Liza, but the process of accepting tore him to pieces. Liza watched him closely after the decision to go to Salinas. She didn't quite know what he was up to, but, like a good and cautious mother, she knew he was up to something. She was a complete realist. Everything else being equal, she was glad to be going to visit her children. She was curious about them and their children. She had no love of places. A place was only a resting stage on the way to heaven. She did not like work for itself, but she did it because it was there to be done. And she was tired. Increasingly, it was more difficult to fight the aches and stiffnesses, which tried to keep her in bed in the morning. Not that they ever succeeded. And she looked forward to heaven as a place where clothes did not get dirty and where food did not have to be cooked and dishes washed. Privately, there were some things in heaven of which she did not quite approve. There was too much singing, and she didn't see how even the elect could survive for very long the celestial laziness which was promised. She would find something to do in heaven. There must be something to take up one's time, some clouds to darn, some weary wings to rub with liniment. Maybe the collars of the robes need a turning now and then. And when you come right down to it, she couldn't believe that even in heaven, there would not be cobwebs in some corner to be knocked down with a cloth-covered broom. She was gay and frightened about the visit to Salinas. She liked the idea so well that she felt there must be something bordering on sin involved in it. And the Chattaqua? Well, she didn't have to go and probably wouldn't. Samuel would run wild. She would have to watch him. She never lost her feeling that he was young and helpless. It was a good thing she did not know that went, what went on in his mind, and, though his mind, what happened to his body. Places were very important to Samuel. The ranch was a relative, and when he left it, he plunged a knife into a darling. But having made up his mind, Samuel set, up, set about doing it well. He made formal calls on all of his neighbors, the old-timers who remembered how it used to be and how it was, and when he drove away from his old friends, they knew they would not see him again, although he did not say it. He took to gazing at the mountains and the trees, even at faces, as though to memorize them for eternity. 
He saved his visit to the Trask place for last. He had not been there for months. Adam was not a young man anymore. The boys were 11 years old, and Lee, well, Lee did not change much. Lee walked to the shed with Samuel. I've wanted to talk to you for a long time, said Lee, but there's so much to do, and I try to get to San Francisco at least once a month. You know how it is, Samuel said. When you know a friend is there, you do not go to see him. Then he's gone, and you blast your conscience to shreds that you did not see him. I heard about your daughter. I'm sorry. I got your letter, Lee. I have it. You said good things. Chinese things, said Lee. I seem to get more Chinese as I get older. There's something changed about you, Lee. What is it? It's my cue, Mr. Hamilton. I've cut off my cue. That's it. We all did. Haven't you heard? The Dowager Empress is gone. China is free. The Manchus are not overlords, and we do not wear cues. It was a proclamation of the new government. There's not a cue left anywhere. Does it make a difference, Lee? Not much. It's easier, but there's a kind of looseness on the scalp that makes me uneasy. It's hard to get used to the convenience of it. How is Adam? He's all right, but he hasn't changed much. I wonder what he was like before. Yes, I've wondered about that. It was a short flowering. The boys must be big. They are big. I'm glad I stayed here. I learned a great deal from seeing the boys grow and helping a little. Did you teach them Chinese? No, Mr. Trask didn't want me to, and I guess he was right. It would have been a needless complication. But I'm their friend. Yes, I'm their friend. They admire their father, but I think they love me. And they're very different. You can't imagine how different. In what way, Lee? You'll see when they come home from school. They're like two sides of a metal. Cal is sharp and dark and watchful, and his brother, well, he's a boy you like before he speaks and like more afterwards. And you don't like Cal? I find myself defending him to myself. He's fighting for his life, and his brother doesn't have to fight. I have the same thing in my brood, said Samuel. I don't understand it. You'd think with all the same training and the same blood, they'd be alike. But they're not. Not at all. Later, Samuel and Adam walked down the oak-shadowed road to the entrance to the draw where they could look out at the Salinas Valley. "'Will you stay to dinner?' Adam asked. "'I will not be responsible for the murder of more chickens,' said Samuel. "'Lee's got a pot roast. Well, in that case—' Adam still carried one shoulder lower than the other from the old hurt. His face was hard and curtained, and his eyes looked at generalities and did not inspect details." The two men stopped in the road and looked out at the valley, green-tinged from the early rains. Samuel said softly, I wonder you do not feel a shame at leaving that land follow. I had no reason to plant it, Adam said. We had that out before. You thought I would change, and I have not changed. Do you take pride in your hurt? Samuel asked. Does it make you seem large and tragic? I don't know. Well think about it. Maybe you're playing a part on a great stage with only yourself as audience. A slight anger came into Adam's voice. Why do you come to lecture me? I'm glad you've come, but why do you dig into me? To see whether I can raise a little anger in you. I'm not a, I'm a nosy man, but there's all that fallow land and here beside me is all that fallow man. It seems a waste and I have a bad feeling about waste because I could never afford it. Is it a good feeling to let your life lie fall fallow? What else could I do? You could try again. Adam faced him. I'm afraid to, Samuel, he said. I'd rather just go about it in this way. Maybe I haven't the energy or the courage. How about your boys? Do you love them? Yes, yes. Do you love one more than the other? Why do you say that? I don't know. Something about your tone. Let's go back to the house, said Adam. They strolled back under the trees. Suddenly, Adam said, Did you ever hear that Kathy was in Salinas? Did you ever hear such a rumor? Did you? Yes, but I don't believe it. I can't believe it. Samuel walked silently in the sandy wheel rut of the road. His mind turned sluggishly in the pattern of Adam and almost wearily took up a thought he had hoped was finished. He said at last, 
You have never let her go. I guess not. But I've let the shooting go. I don't think about that anymore. I can't tell you how to live your life, Samuel said. Although I do, although I do be telling you how to live it. I know that it might be better for you to come out from under your might-have-beens into the winds of the world. And while I tell you, I am myself sifting my memories, the way men pan the dirt under a barroom floor for bits of gold dust that fall between the cracks. It's small mining, small mining. You're too young a man to be panning memories, Adam. You should be getting yourself some new ones so that the mining will be richer when you come to age. Adam's face was bent down, and his jawbone jutted below his temples from clenching. Samuel glanced at him. That's right, he said. Set your teeth in. How we do defend a wrongness. Shall I tell you what you do so you will not think you had invented it? When you go to bed and blow out the lamp, then she stands in the doorway with a little light behind her, and you can see her nightgown stir. And she comes sweetly to your bed, and you, hardly breathing, turn back the covers to receive her, and you move your head over on the pillow to make room for her head beside yours. You can smell the sweetness of her skin, and it smells like no other skin in the world. Stop it! Adam shouted at him. God damn you, stop it! Stop nosing over my life! You're like a coyote sniffing around a dead cow! The way I know, Samuel said softly, is that one came to me that self same way, night after month after year, right to the very now, and I think I should have double bolted my mind and sealed off my heart against her, but I did not. All these years I've cheated Liza, I've given her an untruth, a counterfeit, and I've saved the best for those dark sweet hours, and now I could wish that she may have had some secret caller too, but I'll never know that. I think she would maybe have bolted her heart shut and thrown the key to hell. Adam's hands were clenched and the blood was driven out of his white knuckles. You make me doubt myself, he said fiercely. You always have. I'm afraid of you. What should I do, Samuel? Tell me. I don't know how you saw the thing so clear. What should I do? I know the shoulds, although I never do them, Adam. I always know the shoulds. You should try to find a new Kathy. You should let the new Kathy kill the dream Kathy. Let the two of them fight it out. And you, sitting by, should marry your mind to the winner. That's the second best should. The best would be to search out and find some fresh new loveliness to cancel out the old. I'm afraid to try, said Adam. That's what you've said. And now I'm going to put a selfishness on you. I'm going away, Adam. I came to say goodbye. What do you mean? My daughter Olive has asked Liza and me to visit with her in Salinas, and we're going day after tomorrow. Well, you'll be back, Samuel went on. After we visited with Olive for maybe a month or two, there will come a letter from George, and his feelings will be hurt if we don't visit him in Paso Robles. And after that, Molly will want us in San Francisco, and then Will, and maybe even Joe in the East, if we should live so long. Well... Won't you like that? You've earned it. You've worked hard enough on that dust heap of yours. I love that dust heap, Samuel said. I love it the way a bitch loves her runty pup. I love every flint, the plow-breaking outcroppings, the thin and barren topsoil, the waterless heart of her. Somewhere in my dust heap, there's a richness. You deserve a rest. There, you've said it again, said Samuel. That's what I had to accept, and I have accepted. When you say I deserve a rest, you are saying that my life is over. Do you believe that? That's what I've accepted, Adam said excitedly. You can't do that. Why, if you accept that, you won't live. I know, said Samuel, but you can't do that. Why not? I don't want you to. I'm a nosy old man, Adam, and the sad thing to me is that I'm losing my nosiness. That's maybe how I know it's time to visit my children. I'm having to pretend to be nosy a good deal of the time. I'd rather you worked your guts out on your dust heap. Samuel smiled at him. What a nice thing to hear, and I thank you. It's a good thing to be loved, even late. Suddenly, Adam turned in front of him so that Samuel had to stop. I know what you've done for me, Adam said. I can't return anything. 
but I can ask you for one more thing. If I asked you, would you do me one more kindness and maybe save my life? I would if I could. Adam swung out his hand and made an arc over the west. That land out there. Would you help me to make the garden we talked of? The windmills and the wells and the flats of alfalfa? We could raise flower seeds. There's money in that. Think what it would be like. Acres of sweet peas and gold squares of calendulas. Maybe ten acres of roses for the garden of the west. Think how they would smell on the west wind. You're going to make me cry, Samuel said. And that would be an unseemly thing in an old man. And indeed, his eyes were wet. I thank you, Adam, he said. That sweetness of your offer is a good smell on the west wind. Then you'll do it. No, I will not do it. But I'll see it in my mind when I'm in Salinas, listening to William Jennings Bryan. And maybe I'll get to believe it happened. But I want to do it. Go and see my Tom. He'll help you. He'd plant the world with roses, poor man, if he could. You know what you're doing, Samuel. Yes, I know what I'm doing. Know so well that it's half done. What a stubborn man you are. Contentious, said Samuel. Liza says I'm contentious, but now I'm caught in a web of my children, and I think I like it. The dinner table was set in the house. Lee said, I'd have liked to serve it under the tree like the other times, but the air is chilly. So it is, Lee, said Samuel. The twins came in silently and stood shyly staring at their guest. It's a long time since I've seen you boys, but we named you well. You're Caleb, aren't you? I'm Cal. Well, Cal then, and he turned to the other. Have you found a way to rip the backbone out of your name? Sir? Are you called Aaron? Yes, sir. Lee chuckled. He spells it with one A. The two A's seemed a little fancy to his friends. I've got 35 Belgian hairs, sir, Aaron said. Would you like to see them, sir? The hutch is up by the spring. I've got eight newborns, just born yesterday. I'd like to see them, Aaron, his mouth twitched. Cal, don't tell me you're a gardener. Lee's head snapped around and he inspected Samuel. Don't do that, Lee said nervously. Cal said, next year my father is going to let me have an acre in the flat. Aaron said, I've got a buck rabbit weighs 15 pounds. I'm going to give it to my father for his birthday. They heard Adam's bedroom door opening. Don't tell him, Aaron said quickly. It's a secret. Lee saw it at the pot roast. Always you bring trouble for my mind, Mr. Hamilton, he said. Sit down, boys. Adam came in, turning down his sleeves, and took his seat at the head of the table. Good evening, boys, he said, and they replied in unison. Good evening, father. And, don't you tell, said Aaron. I won't, Samuel assured him. Don't tell what, Adam asked. Samuel said, can't there be a privacy? I have a secret with your son. Cal broke in. I'll tell you a secret too, right after dinner. I'd like to hear it, said Samuel, and I do hope I don't know already what it is. Lee looked up from his carving and glared at Samuel. He began piling meat on the plates. The boys ate quickly and quietly wolfed their food. Aaron said, Will you excuse us, Father? Adam nodded and the two boys went quickly out. Samuel looked after them. They seem older than eleven, he said. I seem to remember that at eleven my brood were howlers and screamers and runners in circles. circles. These seem like grown men. Do they? Adam asked. Lee said, I think I see why that is. There is no woman in the house to put a value on babies. I don't think men care much for babies, and so it was never an advantage to these boys to be babies. There was nothing to gain by it. I don't know whether that is good or bad. Samuel wiped up the remains of gravy in his plate with a slice of bread. Adam, I wonder whether you know what you have in Lee. A philosopher who can cook, or a cook who can think. He has taught me a great deal. You must have learned from him, Adam. Adam said, I'm afraid I didn't listen enough, or maybe he didn't talk. Why didn't you want the boys to learn Chinese, Adam? Adam thought for a moment. It seems a time for honesty, he said at last. I guess it was just plain jealousy. I gave it another name, but maybe I didn't want them to be so 
to be able so easily to go away from me in a direction I couldn't follow. That's reasonable enough and almost too human, said Samuel. But knowing that, it's a great jump. I wonder whether I have ever gone so far. Lee brought the gray enameled coffee pot to the table and filled the cups and sat down. He warmed the palm of his hand against the rounded side of his cup. And then Lee laughed. You've given me great trouble, Mr. Hamilton, and you've disturbed the tranquility of China. How do you mean, Lee? It almost seems that I have told you this, said Lee. Maybe I only composed it in my mind, meaning to tell you. It's an amusing story, anyway. I want to hear, said Samuel, and he looked at Adam. Don't you want to hear, Adam, or are you slipping into your cloud bath? I was thinking of that, said Adam. It's funny. A kind of excitement is coming over me. That's good, said Samuel. Maybe that's the best of all good things that can happen to a human. Let's hear your story, Lee. The Chinese reached to the side of his neck and he smiled. I wonder whether I'll ever get used to the lack of a cue, he said. I guess it, I guess I used it more than I knew. Yes, the story. I told you, Mr. Hamilton, that I was growing more Chinese. Do you ever grow more Irish? It comes and goes, said Samuel. Do you remember when you read us the 16 verses of the fourth chapter of Genesis and we argued about them? I do indeed, and that's a long time ago. Ten years nearly, said Lee. Well, the story bit deeply into me and I went into it word for word. The more I thought about the story, the more profound it became to me. Then I compared the translation we have and they were fairly close. There was only one place that bothered me. The King James Version says this. It is when Jehovah has asked Cain why he is angry. Jehovah says, If thou dost well, thou shalt not be accepted. And if thou dost not well, sin lieth at the floor. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. It was the thou shalt that struck me, because it was a promise that Cain would conquer sin. Samuel nodded, and his children didn't do it entirely, he said. Lee sipped his coffee. Then I got a copy of the American Standard Bible. It was very new then, and it was different in this passage. It says, do thou rule over him. Now this is very different. This is not a promise. It is an order. And I began to stew about it. I wondered what the original word of the original writer had been that these very different translations could be made. Samuel put his palms down on the table and leaned forward and the old young light came into his eyes. Lee, he said, don't tell me you studied Hebrew. Lee said, I'm going to tell you and it's a fairly long story. Will you have a touch of Negepi? You mean the drink that tastes of good rotten apples? Yes, I talk better with it. Maybe I can listen better, said Samuel. While Lee went to the kitchen, Samuel asked, Adam, did you know about this? No, said Adam. He didn't tell me. Maybe I wasn't listening. Lee came back with a stone bottle and three little porcelain cups so thin and delicate that the light shone through them. Dlinky Chinese fashion, he said, and poured the almost black liquor. There's a lot of wormwood in this. It's quite a drink, he said. Has about the same effect as absinthe if you drink enough of it. Samuel sipped the drink. I want to know why you were so interested, he said. Well, it seemed to me that the man who could conceive this great story would know exactly what he wanted to say and there would be no confusion in his statement. You say the man. Do you then not think this is a divine book written by the inky finger of God? I think the mind that could think this story was a curiously divine mind. We have had such a few minds in China, too. I just wanted to know, said Samuel. You're not a Presbyterian after all. I told you I was getting more Chinese. Well, to go on, I went to San Francisco to the headquarters of our family association. Do you know about them? Our great families have centers where any member can get help or give it. The Lee family is very large. It takes care of its own. I have heard of them, said Samuel. You mean Chinese hatchet man fighty tongue war over slave girl? I guess so. It's a little different from that, really, said Lee. I went there because in our family there are a number of ancient reverend gentlemen who are great scholars. They are thinkers in exactness. A man may spend many years pondering a sentence of the scholar you call Confucius. 
I thought there might be experts in meaning who could advise me. They are fine old men. They smoke their two pipes of opium in the afternoon, and it rests and sharpens them, and they sit through the night, and their minds are wonderful. I guess no other people have been able to use opium well. Lee dampened his tongue in the black brew. I respectfully submitted my problem to one of these sages, read him the story, and told him what I understood from it. The next night, four of them met and called me in. We discussed the story all night long. Lee laughed. I guess it's funny, he said. I know I wouldn't dare tell it to many people. Can you imagine four old gentlemen, the youngest is over 90 now, taking on the study of Hebrew? They engaged a learned rabbi. They took to the study as though they were children. Exercise books, grammar, vocabulary, simple sentences. You should see Hebrew written in Chinese ink with a brush. The right to left didn't bother them as much as it would you, since we write up to down. Oh, they were perfectionists. They went to the root of the matter. And you, said Samuel. I went along with them, marveling at the beauty of their proud, clean brains. I began to love my race, and for the first time, I wanted to be Chinese. Every two weeks, I went to a meeting with them, and in my room here, I covered pages with writing. I bought every known Hebrew dictionary. But the old gentlemen were always ahead of me. It wasn't long before they were ahead of our rabbi. He brought a colleague in. Mr. Hamilton, you should have sat through some of those nights of argument and discussion. The questions, the inspection. Oh, the lovely thinking. The beautiful thinking. After two years, we felt that we could approach your 16 verses of the fourth chapter of Genesis. My old gentleman felt that these words were very important too. Thou shalt and do thou. And this was the gold from our mining. Thou mayest. Thou mayest rule over sin. The old gentleman smiled and nodded and felt the years were well spent. It brought them out of their Chinese shells too, and right now they are studying Greek. Samuel said, It's a fantastic story, and I've tried to follow and maybe I've missed somewhere. Why is this word so important? Lee's hand shook as he filled the delicate cups. He drank down his one gulp. Don't you see, he cried, the American Standard Translation orders men to triumph over sin, and you can call sin ignorance. The King James Translation makes a promise in thou shalt, meaning that men will surely triumph over sin. But the Hebrew word, the word tim shall, thou mayest, that gives a choice. It might be the most important word in the world that says the way is open, that throws it right back on a man. For if thou mayest, it is also true that thou mayest not. Don't you see? Yes, I see. I do see. But you do not believe this is divine law. Why do you feel its importance? Ah, said Lee, I've wanted to tell you this for a long time. I even anticipated your questions and I am very well prepared. Any writing which has influenced the thinking in the lives of innumerable people is important. Now, there are many millions in their sects and churches who feel the order, do thou, and throw their weight into obedience. And there are millions more who feel predestination and thou shalt. Nothing they may do can interfere with what will, will, what will be. But thou mayest. Why, that makes a great man. That gives him stature with the gods. For in his weakness and his filth and his murder of his brother, he still has the great choice. He can choose his course and fight it through and win. Lee's voice was a chant of triumph. Adam said, Do you believe that, Lee? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. It is easy out of laziness, out of weakness, to throw oneself into the lap of deity, saying, I couldn't help it. The way was set. But think of the glory of the choice. That makes a man a man. A cat has no choice. A bee must make honey. There's no godliness there. And do you know, these old gentlemen who were sliding gently down to death are too interested to die now? Adam said, Do you mean these Chinese men believe the Old Testament? Lee said, These old men believe a true story, and they know a true story when they hear it. They are critics of truth. They know that these 16 verses are a history of humankind in any age or culture or race. They do not believe a man writes 15 and three-quarter verses of truth and tells a lie with one verb. Confucius tells men how they should live to have good and successful lives. 
But this, this is a ladder to climb to the stars. Lee's eyes shone. You can never lose that. It cuts the feet from under weakness and cowardliness and laziness. Adam said, I don't see how you could cook and raise the boys and take care of me and still do all this. Neither do I, said Lee, but I take my two pipes in the afternoon, no more, no less, like the elders, and I feel that I am a man, and I feel that a man is a very important thing, maybe more important than a star. This is not theology. I have no bent toward gods, but I have a new love for that glittering instrument, the human soul. It is a lovely and unique thing in the universe. It is always attacked and never destroyed, because thou mayest. Lee and Adam walked out to the shed with Samuel to see him off. Lee carried a tin lantern to light the way, for it was one of those clear early winter nights when the sky riots with stars and the earth seems doubly dark because of them. A silence lay on the hills. No animal moved about, neither grass eater nor predator, and the air was so still that the dark limbs and leaves of the live oak stood on moving against the Milky Way. The three men were silent. The bale of the tin lantern squeaked a little as the light swung in Lee's hand. Adam asked, When do you think you'll be back from your trip? Samuel did not answer. Doxology stood patiently in the stall, head down, his milky eyes staring at the straw under his feet. You've had that horse forever, Adam said. He's 33, said Samuel. His teeth are worn off. I have to feed him warm mash with my fingers. And he has bad dreams. He shivers and cries sometimes in his sleep. He's about as ugly a crow bait as I ever saw, Adam said. I know it. I think that's why I picked him when he was a colt. Do you know I paid two dollars for him 33 years ago? Everything was wrong with him. Hoofs like flapjacks, a hock so thick and short. Straight there seem no joints at all. He's hammer-headed and sway-backed. He has a pinched chest and a big behind. He has an iron mouth and he still fights the crupper. With a saddle, he feels as though you are riding a sled over a gravel pit. He can't trot and he stumbles over his feet when he walks. I have never in 33 years found one good thing about him. He even has an ugly disposition. He is selfish and quarrelsome and mean and disobedient. To this day, I won't dare walk behind him because he will surely take a kick at me. When I feed him mash, he tries to bite my hand. And I love him. Lee said, And you named him Doxology. Surely, said Samuel. So ill-endowed a creature deserved, I thought, one grand possession. He hasn't very long now. Adam said, Maybe you should put him out of his misery. What misery? Samuel demanded. He's one of the few happy and consistent beings I've ever met. He must have aches and pains. Well, he doesn't think so. Doxology still thinks he's one hell of a horse. Would you shoot him at him? Yes, I think I would. Yes, I would. You take the responsibility. Yes, I think I would. He's 33. His lifespan is long over. Lee had set his lantern on the ground. Samuel squatted beside it and instinctively stretched his hands for warmth to the butterfly of yellow light. I've been bothered by something, Adam, he said. What is that? You would really shoot my horse because death might be more comfortable? Well, I meant, Samuel said quickly, do you like your life, Adam? Of course not. If I had a medicine that might cure you and also might kill you, should I give it to you? Inspect yourself, man. What medicine? No, said Samuel. If I tell you, Believe me when I say it may kill you. Lee said, Be careful, Mr. Hamilton, be careful. What is this? Adam demanded. Tell me what you're thinking of. Samuel said softly, I think for once I will not be careful. Lee, if I am wrong, listen. If I am mistaken, I accept the responsibility and I will take what blame there is to take. Are you sure you're right? Lee asked anxiously. Of course I'm not sure. Adam, do you want the medicine? Yes, I don't know what it is, but give it to me. Adam, Kathy is in Salinas. She owns a whorehouse, the most vicious and depraved in this whole end of the country. 
The evil and ugly, the distorted and slimy, the worst things humans can think up are for sale there. The crippled and crooked come there for satisfaction. But it is worse than that. Kathy, and she is now called Kate, takes the fresh and young and beautiful and so maims them they can never be whole again. Now, there's your medicine. Let's see what it does to you. You're a liar, Adam said. No, Adam, many things I am, but a liar I am not. Adam whirled on Lee. Is this true? I'm no antidote, said Lee. Yes, it's true. Adam stood swaying in the lantern light, and then he turned and ran. They could hear his heavy steps running and tripping. They heard him falling over the brush and scrambling and clawing his way up outward the slope. The sound of him stopped only when he had gone over the brow of the hill. Lee said, "'Your medicine acts like poison.' "'I take responsibility,' said Samuel. "'Long ago I learned this. "'When a dog has eaten stri strike nine and is going to die,' You must get an axe and carry him to a chopping block. Then you must wait for his next convulsion, and in that moment, chop off his tail. Then, if the poison has not gone too far, your dog may recover. The shock of pain can counteract the poison. Without the shock, he will surely die. But how do you know this is the same? Lee asked. I don't, but without it, he would surely die. You're a brave man, Lee said. No, no. I'm an old man, and if I should have anything on my conscience, it won't be for long. Lee asked, What do you suppose he'll do? I don't know, said Samuel, but at least he won't sit around and mope. Here, hold the lantern for me, will you? In the yellow light, Samuel slipped the bit in Doxology's mouth, a bit worn so thin that it was a flake of steel. The check rein had been abandoned long ago. The old hammerhead was free to drag his nose if he wished, or to pause and crop grass beside the road. Samuel didn't care. Tenderly, he bucked the crupper, and the horse edged around to try to kick him. When Dox was between the shafts of the cart, Lee asked, Would you mind if I rode along with you a little? I'll walk back. Come along, said Samuel, and he tried not to notice that Lee held him up into the cart. The night was very dark and Doc showed his disgust for night traveling by stumbling every few steps. Samuel said, Get on with it, Lee. What is it you want to say? Lee did not appear surprised. Maybe I'm nosy the way you say you are. I get to thinking. I know probabilities, but tonight you fooled me completely. I would have taken any bet that Jew of all men would not have told Adam. Did you know about her? Of course, said Lee. Do the boys know? I don't think so, but that's only a matter of time. You know how cruel children are. Someday in the schoolyard, it will be shouted at them. Maybe he ought to take them away from here, said Samuel. Think about that, Lee. My question isn't answered, Mr. Hamilton. How were you able to do what you did? Do you think I was that wrong? No, I don't mean that at all. But I've never thought of you as taking any strong, unchanging stand on anything. This has been my judgment. Are you interested? Show me the man who isn't interested in discussing himself, said Samuel. Go on. You're a kind man, Mr. Hamilton, and I've always thought it was the kindness that comes from not wanting any trouble. And your mind is as facile as a young lamb leaping in a daisy field. You have never, to my knowledge, taken a bulldog grip on anything. And then tonight you did a thing that tears down my whole picture of you. Samuel wrapped the lines around a stick stuck in the whip socket, and Doxology stumbled on down the, putty, the ruddy road. The old man stroked his beard, and it shone very white in the starlight. He took off his black hat and laid it on his lap. I guess it surprised me as much as it did you, he said. But if you want to know why, look into yourself. I don't understand you. If you had only told me about your studies earlier, it might have made a great difference, Lee. I still don't understand you. Careful, Lee, you'll get me to talking. I told you my Irish came and went. It's coming now. Lee said, Mr. Hamilton, you're going away and you're not coming back. You do not intend to live very much longer. That's true, Lee. How did you know? There's death all around you. It shines from you. I didn't know anyone could see it, Samuel said. You know, Lee, I think of my life as a kind of music. 
not always good music, but still having form and melody. And my life has not been a full orchestra for a long time now. A single note only, and that note on changing sorrow. I'm not alone in my attitude, Lee. It seems to me that too many of us conceive of a life as ending in defeat. Lee said, Maybe everyone is too rich. I have noticed that there is no dissatisfaction like that of the rich. Feed a man, clothe him, put him in a good house, and he will die of despair. It was your two-word retranslation, Lee. Thou mayest. It took me by the throat and shook me. And when the dizziness was over, a path was open, new and bright. And my life, which is ending, seems to be going on to an ending wonderful. And my music has a new last melody like a bird song in the night. Lee was peering at him through the darkness. That's what it did to these old men of my family. Thou mayest rule over sin, Lee. That's it. I do not believe all men are destroyed. I can name you a dozen who are not, and they are the ones the world lives by. It is true of the spirit as it is true of battles. Only the winners are remembered. Surely most men are destroyed, but there are others who, like pillars of fire, guide frightened men through the darkness. Thou mayest. Thou mayest. What glory! It is true that we are weak and sick and quarrelsome, but if that is all we ever were, we would, millenniums ago, have disappeared from the face of the earth. A few remnants of fossilized jawbone, some broken teeth and strata of limestone, would be the only mark man would have left on his existence in the world. But the choice, Lee, the choice of winning, I had never understood it or accepted it before. Do you see now why I told Adam tonight? I exercised the choice. Maybe I was wrong, but by telling him, I also forced him to live or get off the pot. What is that word, Lee? Tim Shell, said Lee. Will you stop the cart? You'll have a long walk back. Lee climbed down. Samuel, he said. Here I am, the old man chuckled. Liza hates me for me to say that. Samuel, you've gone beyond me. It's time, Lee. Goodbye, Samuel, Lee said, and he walked hurriedly back along the road. He heard the iron tires of the cart grinding on the road. He turned and looked after it, and on the slope he saw old Samuel against the sky, his white hair shining with starlight. Thanks for joining me for tonight's edition of Booked for the Night. I'll be back Monday night with more of East of Eden by John Steinbeck. Until then, thanks for listening, and good night.